we will go ahead and get started. Good morning all and welcome back. We are reconvening our meeting from yesterday. Uh, so it's my understanding this is a continuation meeting, so we'll just continue on. And <clears throat> with that, uh, okay. if I could just get Miss Taylor to please okay. call the roll. Certainly. I would like to ask everyone to please mute their lines. Chairman Vasquez. Present. Vice Chair Schaefer. Present. Member Gaines. Present. Member Cohen. Hello. Present. Deputy Controller Stowers. Present. So we have a quorum is present and the board meeting is now called back to order. Uh, with that, just another friendly reminder, especially for those guests that are joining us today. Uh, as I know we're going to have several different uh, partners uh, live streaming with us and just uh, letting everybody know that we share the same line. So just to make it as easy as, as possible for our staff as they're recording for our transcriptionists, <clears throat> if you would just please have a little bit of patience and I will, as I identify you to speak, uh, you will be ready to go. And once again, um, your patience is greatly appreciated. And with that, I will open up uh, with members and I believe member Gaines <clears throat> had some opening remarks before we start the meeting. Member Gaines. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chair Vasquez. I appreciate this. I just wanted to um, recognize an individual in my, in my community who passed away, so wanted to adjourn in memory at the conclusion of today's meeting. And I uh, want to take a moment to recognize the loss of Austin Ramsey, who passed away a few days ago. His father called him a warrior, a brother, a son, and a friend to so many. He was all of those things, and his loss will be felt throughout the tight-knit community. Austin has served and has, excuse me, Austin served his country as an airborne ranger in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Afterwards, he joined the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department where he continued his service, helping to keep that county, my home county, safe. He was, uh, he lived a life that was dedicated to protecting others. He has gone too soon. His family, along with his friends and colleagues and fellow servicemen and women will mourn his loss deeply. I want to close by saying we need to care for our veterans and for our public safety officers. They may be dealing with issues that are impossible for many of us to understand. They've been trained to be brave and strong and independent, and those traits give us the, fight, the finest fighting force in history. The American soldier is one of the world's gold standard, but they can struggle. They still need help. They face problems where their battlefield training will not help. It falls on us to reach out to them, to honor them beyond the years of their service by helping them reintegrate into the civilian world and lead a happy and productive life. God bless Austin Ramsey, his family, and everyone who lives that he touched in his life. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad that you did bring this up. I know uh, November next month is Veterans Month, where we look and we honor our veterans. So thank you for sharing that with us. And my condolences to his family as well. With that, uh, members, if we could, uh, let me have Ms. Taylor uh, open up with her for opening announcements, then we'll get started with our order of business. Our first order of business today is an announcement regarding public teleconference participation. Good morning and thank you for joining today's Board of Equalization meeting via teleconference. Throughout the duration of today's meeting, you will primarily be in a listen only mode. As you may know from our public agenda notice and our website, we have requested that individuals who wish to make a public comment fill out the public comment submission form 
found on our additional information webpage in advance of today's meeting, or alternatively, participate in today's meeting by providing your public comment live. After the presentation of an item has concluded, we will begin by identifying any public comment requests that have been received by our board proceeding staff with the AT&T operator providing directions for you to identify yourself. After all known public commenters have been called, the operator will also provide public comment instructions to the individuals participating via teleconference. Accordingly, if you intend to make a public comment today, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. We ask that everyone who is not intending to make a public comment, please mute their line or minimize background noise. If there are technical difficulties when we are in the public comment portion of our meeting, we will do our best to read submitted comments into the record at appropriate times. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. And with that, if you would please call our first item. The first item is K1C, Executive Director's Report, Organizational Report. Report on the status of pending and upcoming organizational issues. This matter will be introduced by Ms. Fleming. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members. Uh, just doing a quick audio check to confirm that you all can hear me. Thank yes. You. I'm Brenda Fleming, the Executive Director. Members, today's report will provide updates on our priorities and significant accomplishments since last month's meeting. As a reminder, members, we will continue our remote board meetings through January 31st, 2022, per Assembly Bill 361. As we approach that time frame, I will provide updates for resuming in-person public meetings as more information is known. Second item, members, as plans are being finalized for our Advisory Council kickoff meeting, which, as you know, is scheduled for November 2nd. As you know, the purpose of the Advisory Council is to provide a forum for the Executive Director to receive input with a diversity of perspectives on matters relating to the exploration and development of approaches and best practices to address the complex tax issues which confront Californian citizens, businesses, and policymakers. I do look forward to sharing the highlights and takeaways from the meeting to add to our list of important modernization and improvement priorities. And so, of course, members, I will continue to keep you informed. Next item, members. As you know, the annual Assessors Conference is being held next week in Sacramento. We look forward to the opportunity to participate in this year's conference. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Assessor Dronenberg, who's current president of CAA uh, is on with us. And so later in his comments, he may make a comment. Next item members, believe it or not, we are quickly approaching the end of the 2021 calendar year. In partnership with you, we have accomplished a great deal of, of uh, taxation business. Staff members are preparing a summary of our 2021 accomplishments for us to highlight at the December board meeting. I look forward to celebrating the good work that we've achieved under your leadership. Members, if there are no questions on those general highlights, I'll move on to the K1D item on status report on options for COVID-19's impact on property tax deadlines. <laughs> members, as you know, Member Cohen introduced this topic as an L item um, in the April time at the April board meeting. And over the past several months, we've discussed options which could provide relief for those impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Just a quick summary of what we've done so far. At our August board meeting, if you recall, staff presented sample language for proposed constitutional and statutory amendments for the board's discussion. For your reference, it's issue paper 21-002, and it's again attached to this month's PAN also. The board members by consensus, you assigned me to work with the county assessors and the assessment appeals board clerks to get their input on the operational impact of extending deadlines. Their input, of course, was and is necessary for further development 
of potential legislative language. Next, we were asked to then report back at the September board meeting, which we did and more discussion occurred. My staff have continued to engage in discussions with representatives of the California Assessors Association and the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials to get their input on extending deadlines intended to provide relief to taxpayers uh, again impacted by COVID-19 or, or any other public calamity. For today's discussion, the goal is to share and discuss the stakeholder submissions that have been received for use in the development of the next version of the proposed language. This next version for simplicity will refer to as version two, and that will be presented at the November meeting. To date, I have received input from both the clerks and CADA concerning the draft language presented in August. Both of their submissions have been attached to the agenda for your reference. Joining me and available to participate in today's report and discussion are the Honorable Mr. Ernie Dronenberg, San Diego County Assessor, Recorder Clerk, and CAA President. Mr. John McKibben, um, Deputy Clerk of the LA County Board of Supervisors. Um, and in, if Mr. McKibben is not here, then Mr. Tom Parker, all of, also from the LA County Board, are here to participate. A representative from the California Alliance of Taxpayer Advocates, CADA, is also here to join us and participate in this morning's discussion. I'm also, of course, joined by my staff, Mr. David Young, Property Tax Deputy Director, and Mr. Richard Moon, our Senior Property Tax Counsel. Uh, members, I'll just pause to turn it over to you um, for any comments. Members, do we have any comments or questions? I just had, oh, uh, I see member Cohen. Go ahead, and then I'll I have one quick one. Go ahead, member Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. It's good to be back with you. Good morning to the executive director. I, uh, Ms. Fleming, Fleming, just want to take a moment and thank you and your staff uh, for working on the language for the proposed statutory and constitutional amendments. Um, it's very important that during this process that we involve stakeholders and the public. You, you, you know this, you know how I feel about making sure that we're transparent. Um, I believe that the board endorses the policy of providing additional authority to extend deadlines um, in the wake of the lessons learned from the pandemic. I believe that this is an ongoing process um, and welcome continuing the impact, continuing, continuing to push the urgency a um, couple things I just want to note that the, for the public that the constitutional amendments to provide relief to taxpayers over 55 and others who couldn't transfer their base year values within the two year constitutionally mandated limits are are important are important pieces of legislation and the language for these amendments should be fine tuned by staff approved in concept uh, by the board. And um, and. And, and, and to appear on the November 22nd ballot. Also noting for the public that these amendments, um, it's a high hurdle. We are proposing constitutional amendments that will require the approval of two thirds of both houses on the legislature. So what we are undertaking is, or potentially undertaking is no easy feat. Um, but I do wanna note that there is continued urgency now to continue the drafting process with the goal of receiving language that can be endorsed in concept by the board. And what happens is, is once we endorse the concept as a board, then we will be able to go to approach members of the legislature um, to uh, and ask them to endorse uh, such relief for um, for taxpayers. So um, Ms. Fleming, when we hear the report, I'm going to give you a heads up on my notes. I'm going to ask uh, that that you come back and you just give us a, a light touch, a report back. This is in November mm -hmm. or, um, on the suggested final language. I just want to make sure that uh, we are walking the, the public as well as the board in every aspect of this process, even if it's taking little baby steps. Um, and I want to also make sure that we are we, we that we not let the quest for perfection interfere with the good. Um, and and uh, and that we need to really that we do need to move on this now. So thank you in for your past work and thank you in the future for the continued work that you're going to do on this issue. Mr. Chair, I turn the meeting back over to you. Thanks for giving me a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, 
I just had one and more of a clarifying question for you, uh, Brenda, as you move forward. Uh, <clears throat> just once again, I guess just to clarify that we are, I guess for everybody's benefit that's listening and those that are uh, with, with your task force and your presenters, that we will be discussing two proposals for extension or potentially extending deadlines. Is that correct? That is correct. And so just to, for clarity, if I could just restate it. So there are two in the issue paper, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Moon to just pop on to, to support me in this portion of the discussion. In our issue paper that was originally attached to the August PAN, we speak to some, some statutory amendments first to Government Code 15620 and RTC uh, 155. Um, and those deal with um, some of our existing uh, um, provisions for for uh, for deadlines. Um, those primarily are for materials submitted to the board. Um, the second is the constitutional amendments to um, to uh, Article 13, Section 2. Richard, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but those deal that constitutional set of provisions is dealing with the extension of deadlines for base year value transfers. So it's two distinct paths. One is a statutory path and one is a constitutional path. Gentlemen, correct me if I'm misstating. That's great. That's cool. Thank you. So with that in mind, uh, you mentioned Section 155 uh, is the alternative staff have prepared, right? Which would clarify the board's authority to extend deadlines for assessors, county boards, and taxpayers unable to meet filing deadlines due to the governor's pro proclaimed emergencies. Uh, protecting everyone in the public uh, calamity is important and they are often uh, shared the same deadlines. So I just want to make sure we're all speaking about the same. Uh, well, you mentioned already section 155 and the other one, I guess is a constitutional potential uh, amendment moving forward. With that, uh, if there's no other comments or questions from any of the other members, uh, I will turn it back to you, Ms. Flemings. Thank you. Um, so members um, and, and team today, part of the discussion is really for us to just to acknowledge, um, and we will uh, of course open the mic to give uh, uh, our, our partners in this an opportunity to comment. Really what we were looking for is based upon the material that was presented at the August meeting, the issue paper that staff presented, we wanted to allow at the September meeting and then again at this meeting um, by having that information on the pan to invite stakeholders to provide their their um, submissions of proposed um, amendments or edits to our language or to further it. But basically they submitted material to weigh in on uh, the material uh, um, in the issue paper. We have received input from the clerks um, and we've received input from from CADA. Um, and so, of course, in a partnership with CAA, we, that's our norm to just collaborate uh, as a part of the, the alleged work. Um, and so what we were wanting to examine today is one, just to acknowledge what we've received so that we're transparent about what's been received. All of that material is on the pan. The second point is to acknowledge uh, or just to state to what degree those submissions from those external stakeholders aligned, where it aligned with our draft, from the issue paper or where there were gaps. That, that assessment of how close we are or how far away we are will determine what our next steps are. And so in talking to staff, we feel like we are fairly aligned and I'm gonna do pause for a minute to give Mr. Mr. Young and Mr. Moon an opportunity to comment on the details, but we don't see that there's that much distance. In summary, there doesn't seem to be any issue or question regarding government code 15620. There doesn't appear to be any conflict and that's a statutory change. So and then the second statutory item is RTC 155. There is some differences of opinion there and we'll Richard and Dave will talk about that. When we look at the second lane, which is the uh, constitutional path, there doesn't seem to be any conflict there. So to the extent that there is alignment or general agreement or consensus with the constitutional uh, provisions, we can probably just go ahead with words, you know, direction and adoption today. We could proceed with the constitutional draft language and then present that information at the November meeting. 
We could also proceed, if back in the statutory lane, we could proceed with drafting language for Government Code 15620. I'm looking at my team to <laughs> give yes, me correct. an option or another. Um, now, the third option, statutory, is RTC 155. We can do one of two things. We can take it, the submissions that we've got, and we can try to draft some some something that's the middle road version of you know the, the differences. Present that at the November meeting is one option, um, and then represent it, have more discussion, or uh, we could we could do what we would normally do in these circumstances where there's differences of opinion. We would have, as you know, members, an interested parties process, um, and in lieu of doing the normal interested parties process, which is oftentimes quite lengthy, we could do an accelerated interested parties process just to give more opportunity to take the conversation into that that forum. Um, again, it's a it's a publicly announced meeting, so there's transparency to it, but it would give us another forum to really get down into the detail to try to negotiate um, and come to some consensus on the language. Then we would still we would do that within between now and the November meeting. The outcome of that interested accelerated interested parties discussion would be a draft that by then we would have reached some degree of consensus. We could then present present that at the November meeting. So the difference there would be if we do an accelerated interested parties process, we could have consensus before the November meeting, or we can just take it offline. We and my staff um, can start to draft something and present it um, at the November meeting without consensus, and we would have to reach consensus at you know if in the November timeframe. My recommendation would be, um, uh, and I'll, before I make that recommendation, but my recommendation is if we if we if we think the consensus uh, is not there, then we start with the accelerated process. So when we come back to you in November, we've got you know a better a better more cooked product, if you will. Uh, gentlemen, I open it up to Mr. Young and Mr. Moon to correct anything that I've misstated. <laughs> no, Ms. Ms. Fleming, I believe you stated it very very accurately and well. Um, I personally, since we have uh, invited guests to speak, I would I would very much appreciate their comments. Mm -hmm. If there is any any ability to reach any type of consensus, maybe we can do it now. If not, um, there is always, as Ms. Fleming so eloquently put it, we can always we can always try a little bit more on a, a, in the IP an accelerate IP process, but <clears throat> and then come back with alternatives for the board's uh, action. Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Moon, any comments? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to our first uh, uh, invited speaker, Mr. Dronenberg. Uh, no, nothing to add from me. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman, honorable members, with your permission, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Dronenberg to join the discussion. Good morning, honorable mentions <laughs> members. <laughs> uh, um, and you're, you're an honorable mention too, so. <laughs> Um, I, I uh, agree with what your your uh, your target is. Um, we have a legislative committee scheduled for next week. If I get a draft of your proposal today, I will. Uh, I'll after this meeting, I will call the alleged chairman and have him schedule that item to be considered by our legislative committee and pass that through them next week at our, our annual meeting in Sacramento. Um, we have had a policy for years uh, um, of wanting to give input as much as possible, but not spending a lot of times until we see what somebody really wants us to do. Uh, and so having this draft will give our uh, our committee a really good chance to dig in and we'll get that to them right away and they can discuss it next week. Thank you, Assessor Dronenberg. I, and, and my comments on on the uh, to date, uh, we're, there is no, uh, I've informally run the ideas by the two or three different meetings and there's been no objections, but um, we'll see what it looks like in print. Thank you for that input. Uh, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members, if you would allow, I would also like to invite, um, I think Mr. Tom Parker's on with us um, and Mr. John McKibben. Mr. McKibben, are you available?
Yes, I am, Ms. Fleming. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Vasquez and members. Uh, I am John McKibben. I'm representing today the uh, California Association of Clerks and Election Officials, CACEO. Uh, on item, uh, this item specifically with regard to revenue and taxation code section 155, our association has no position or objections to the other constitutional amendments and uh, government code amendments that are under consideration with respect to the issue paper we're talking about today. Um, as you know, Section 155 deals with extensions of administrative deadlines affecting assessors and county boards of equalization and assessment appeals boards. In 2020, the clerk sought relief from your board on the two-year deadline for decisions on assessment appeals under our uh, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 1604C due to the fact that coronavirus had caused county boards to completely shut down in many or most counties. County boards were then unable to hold hearings, many of which involved applications that were going to expire in the near term. Um, your board expressed frustration, if you will recall, in 2020 that you could only provide only a one-time extension of 40 days on the two-year deadline under calamity uh, uh, conditions. Uh, this frustration was expressed again earlier this year when you directed staff to prepare an issue paper on the subject. However, that issue paper in its discussion of uh, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 155 in Alternative 1 discussed the possibility of expanding the code section to allow taxpayers to request extensions of deadlines in Division 1 of the Revenue Tax Code dealing with property taxation. We strongly disagree with that, with that specific approach. In our letter to your board on September 16th, we proposed the simple conservative draft of language to extend the 30 day uh, provided in the code section to not more than 60 days and not more than one calendar year in case of public cal calamity rather than 40 days. Our proposed language also would permit your board to authorize multiple extensions of time for public calamities as needed under the circumstances of the partic particular public calamity trying to keep it narrowly focused. Although we recognize your board may wish to adjust the specific timelines included in our proposal, we do recommend these timelines or something very similar to them should be concluded in proposed legislation in order to address the problems posed by health emergencies such as COVID or similar public emergencies. We believe our approach is an appropriate conservative one that deserves your consideration and approval. We also strongly recommend that you reject CADA's proposal to open up such deadline extensions to any and all taxpayers. We believe this would create chaos in the property tax system, which we stress is indeed a system that involves numerous processes that must be followed closely by assessors, clerks, tax collectors, and county auditor controllers in order to make the system work properly for the benefit of all Californians. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I would like to defer to Tom Parker to make his comments too from a legal standpoint, if that is permissible, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. McKibben. Mr. Parker. Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Fleming, Chair Vasquez, Vice Chair Schaefer, and honorable board members. For the record, Tom Parker, Los Angeles County Council's office, and I am the AAB Council for Los Angeles County. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today to your board. Um, getting to a more legal perspective real quickly, Revenue and Taxation Code 155.3, which has been on the books for as many years as 155, grants the state controller's office the same oversight authority over tax collectors and auditor controllers that your board has under 155 over assessors and county boards. I, I note this only to make the point that some of the proposals to amend 155 are very broad and would authorize the state board to change any deadlines in a rather big part of the revenue and taxation code. And I would urge you not to step on the toes of the state controller's office 
and the existing oversight jurisdiction that they have over several of the county departments that deal with property tax. CADA's language, as Mr. McKibben noted, will definitely create chaos because under that language, one single taxpayer could seek a deadline extension from your board. Now that means county staff are going to have to track that individual taxpayer differently than the, the rest of the taxpayers in that county. And that really doesn't make sense. 155 is not in the part of the revenue and taxation code where taxpayer deadline relief is warranted. Um, in a case such as a pandemic, that's clearly more in the province of other authorities um, to, to get relief. Um, the focus of the state board should be where it is and has been historically and jurisdictionally with requests from county boards and assessors. And um, I'll cut my comments there. I'll answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Chairman Vasquez and honorable members, um, if you would allow, I would now invite uh, Ms. Rubowski from the California Alliance of Taxpayer Associates, um, advo uh, Taxpayer Advocates from CADA to, um, to comment. Ms. Rubowski. Ms. Fleming, this is Richard Ayub appearing on behalf of CADA. I don't believe Ms. Rabowski was uh, scheduled to speak on this particular topic. I believe I was. I think my name shows on the agenda. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Ms. No Ryan. problem. I appreciate that. Um, Chairman Vasquez, Vice Chair Schaefer, members, honorable members of the board. I'm Richard Ayub of Ashland Poly, Ayub and Matarisi, appearing on behalf of CADA with respect to the position paper. Uh, submitted in a letter by CADA on October 14th. Um, as that letter indicates, we of course agree with the constitutional amendments and the suggested amendment to 15 uh, 620 of the government code. We do have some issues, however, with respect to the exact language for the amendments uh, proposed to 155. Uh, in the spirit of the issue paper as drafted by the State Board of Equalization uh, staff on this issue, we agree that the taxpayers are entitled to uh, equal consideration of due process and equity here uh, on matters within the board's jurisdiction. I wanna make that very clear. And there are many areas that fall within that. Uh, rules uh, 302 and 313 governing hearing procedure, a change of ownership statements uh, required by the BOE 100B. Uh, all of these are areas on which the deadlines for assessors and taxpayers intersect and are within the power of the Assessment Appeals Board. And all CADA is asking and all we believe we're following in the, the sentiment of the board's issue paper is to grant the same latitude to taxpayers with respect to deadlines that are occasioned by calamities and emergency situations, not willy-nilly as you know might be suggested uh, in some people's minds senior transfer deadlines, disaster relief claim deadlines, change of, ownership, change of ownership statement filing deadlines, appeal hearings are all issues that come within the board's jurisdiction in terms of its rulemaking ability and, and as prescribed by the rules in 15606 of the government code. Um, some examples of why this is necessary. County assessors and AAB staff have been working remotely and in part are very hard to you know, uh, interact with in, in a remote session. I mean, just the uh, opening of this session and the difficulties of some technical issues demonstrate that this is not the best way to communicate. And when you can't go in to see the assessor, uh, it's difficult to get things done in a timely manner. For example, the LA County Hall of Administration has been closed to the public for over 18 months. It just reopened last week. And you can think of what that does in terms of the taxpayer's ability to conduct meaningful business within a limited time period. Uh, we believe that the suggested language in our letter, thus limiting the uh, uh, 
taxpayers' interest to statements and reports or documents uh, required under that division, uh, 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 limit it to those items within the state board's jurisdiction. The other thing that we address in our letter is this the request for subsequent extensions. We believe that subsequent extensions of time should be uh, approved by the board directly, probably after a hearing, and that's set forth in our letter to prevent the continued postponement willy-nilly is almost, almost ad hoc without any kind of oversight. We believe that some limitation on the extensions is appropriate and the board's review uh, seems to make sense. I would add also just in response to what uh, Mr. Parker and Mr. McKibben were saying, uh, I, I don't think we're that far apart and we normally can come together on these kinds of things. Uh, and I do understand their concern about the balkanization of the process by different taxpayers raising these uh, issues and, and creating some administrative difficulty. Um, we can try and work on that point, but I would ask if the taxpayers can't somehow make this request to the state board in a similar manner that the county clerks can, who's there to protect the taxpayers when these deadlines are very rigid and subject to no extension? So with that, I would uh, offer my availability to make, answer any questions and uh, clarify any points that I've raised. Thank you, Mr. Ayub. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members, uh, turn it back to you. Thank you. Uh, I see one hand up. Uh, member Gaines, go ahead, Member Gaines. Yeah, I'd like to, um, if uh, Mr. Ayub, if I could speak to him or ask him a question just in terms of uh, what sort of examples do you think might come forward before the BOE? Uh, by an individual taxpayer. And uh, do you think that would happen very often? I, I don't think it would happen very often. And I think it would be more in the nature, um, Member Gaines, that, uh, it, for example, um, responding to a BOE 100B, uh, I think if one taxpayer has an issue, I think most taxpayers are going to have an issue. And I think if you're extending deadlines, it's not going to be on an ad hoc basis one by one, but you're going to be considering it from a policy standpoint. Um, should we allow an extra 30 days to uh, prevent the uh, imposition of an automatic 90 day penalty? So for example, uh, if uh, in a family limited partnership, a father transfers some interest to a son and it triggers a change in ownership, that's a, uh, a, a an opaque change of ownership that must be reported within 90 days. Often a lot of taxpayers don't have the ability to report within 90 days. And if they don't report within 90 days, there's an automatic 10% penalty. I as an interested party or Cato might or, or some other taxpayers group, uh, IPT or some other uh, California Taxpayers Association might see that this is a problem and say, hey, we need to extend that 90 days to 120 days in, to cover those situations where a BOE 100B uh, could be impacted by the inability to get advice from the board, advice from a professional advisor on a transaction. Um, mm -hmm. People are getting trapped under the current rule now, and everything is being exacerbated by things like the pandemic. And that's just one example. Calamity claims, the fire claims are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, subject to certain time limitation. Those issues, um, you know, are, are very, very important. And uh, as a matter of public policy, I think this board would want to allow taxpayer groups the ability to, on behalf of taxpayers, extend these deadlines when appropriate. Yeah, that, I mean, that's just my, I guess that would be kind of my natural uh, viewpoint is that I'd want to make sure that taxpayers had an opportunity to seek remedy. And if it met before the BOE, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I guess we could, um, you know, based on the circumstances, we could look at always making some adjustments too, if we felt like we we're having uh, challenges trying to address the needs of many taxpayers. Maybe coalitions could be developed on, you know, similar issues and things of that nature that could be brought before uh, the board. Um, I would also like to hear from Mr. McKibben to see uh, what his thoughts are on this issue, because I, I just naturally would want a taxpayer, if they had a problem, I, I would naturally want to try to address that. Um, uh, and maybe he could help me in terms of understanding this. Is he concerned about backlogs coming before the, the BOE? 
too many people coming b before the BOE, or what, 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 what is that specifically the issue? Well, our, our concern, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Gaines, our concern is that um, the, the, the only deadline that I can think of that we're, we're talking about with regard to taxpayers in, 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 in relation to the, the uh, County Board of Equalization is the filing deadline for appeals. That's a fairly lengthy um, time period, and we think that despite calamity conditions even, the taxpayer is likely to be able to file that, that appeal. He's only responsible for that one property, presumably. Obviously, some have more than one appeal to file in any given year, but it's a fairly small, finite number. Um, that, as Tom Parker indicated, it would be very difficult to track individual taxpayers or keep track of which appeals uh, that are that are pending are going to be subject to different deadlines than would otherwise be allowed. Um, it would be quite a considerable administrative headache and cost. And, and I don't know that the, the, the county boards typically, particularly in the large counties with large workload, are prepared to, to be able to take that on. Okay. Do you because perceive it as being we're, a... We're, we're anxious that people do have the ability to file an appeal, but I don't see that... that uh, uh, changing uh, Section 155 the way it's been proposed is 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 a is a viable solution. Okay, all right, uh, thank you. And I, Mr. Abu, are you still there? Yes, Board Member Gaines, I am, and I I would like the opportunity to address what Mr. McKibben said um, about the filing of appeals. Uh, that's an excellent example. During the pandemic, a lot of businesses were closed; people couldn't go into their businesses and uh, bills would be sent, uh, adjusted bills or escape assessment bills would be sent to an office where nobody was there. And they had 60 days to um, uh, appeal that particular bill. The, the, the notions of due process are, are offended by that. If you don't have a reasonable opportunity to get, get some time, you might find out two days before uh, the deadline that you, you've gotten an, an additional assessment. But even putting that aside, uh, just addressing the regular assessments, which are due on November 30th and most uh, assessment appeals, which are due on November 30th and most jurisdictions, uh, a lot of taxpayers don't get their bills until October. They don't have notice until October that they may want to appeal. Um, while it does seem like a long time frame from July 1 to November 30th, uh, you really don't get notice. The average guy doesn't get notice till he has a bill in his hand. And if you're getting your bill on October 15th, you've got 45 days and you're impacted by the pandemic. Um, it, it would be nice to have the ability to get some time. We ran into, in our practice, a lot of people who had difficulty complying with the deadlines last time out. Okay, all right, well, thank you. I, I just, uh, I wanna make sure we address this uh, before we conclude today, but it seems like there are some, there's an issue there and I just wanna make sure taxpayers have a pathway for a resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Any other co uh, other comments from other members? The only quick question I had, and it's going back to staff. Uh, Brenda, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that you know you uh, staff was able to obtain, I guess, the the proposal that came in, and I'm and it sounds like it just came in from CADA. Is that correct? So to date, from uh, from that stakeholder community, in terms of tax advocates and tax representatives, the only input is from from CADA, the California Alliance for Tax Advocates. And did staff have ample time? Did you folks have ample time to review and look it over before this meeting? We've had our preliminary review of it. We haven't done our deep dive yet, as of yet. Okay, that was my question. All right. Uh, seeing no other hands or comments, I will. Turn it back over to Ms. Taylor. So, uh, Honorable um, Chairman Vasquez, and uh, oh, unless you had something else, Ben, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I may, sir. So, um, it, it appears, um, and just in terms of next steps, if I may. Sure. Uh, first, starting with the constitutional amendment, if there is doesn't appear to be any disagreement or lack of consensus 
With the board's permission, I would recommend that we uh, begin the process of outlining some language for the constitutional amendment to those provisions cited in the issue paper. Start the draft something there and working in collaboration with uh, with um, our partners at, at CAA. Present that information at the November meeting so that the board by their general consensus or agreement can decide the next steps to move forward with a constitutional amendment. So at the November meeting, we would come back with a what I'll refer to just for clarity on the record, a draft two, version two of a constitutional proposed constitutional language. That would be my first recommendation would ask the board's consideration of that option as the second recommendation for your consideration is as it relates to the statutory path for government code 15620. If there are no objections and it appears we have consensus based upon what we've heard today and in the material staff be allowed to proceed with drafting version two of proposed changes amendments to uh, government code 15620 as it relates to deadline extensions. Similarly, we would present that draft two to the board for your consideration and adoption uh, approval at the November meeting. My third recommendation the board would allow is I'd recommend that we um, begin an accelerated interested parties process to have further discussion with stakeholders on RTC 155 to try to come to some consensus uh, between now and the next few weeks on some alignment, some consensus on RTC 155 with the intent of coming back with a draft two at the November meeting. If we're not able to reach consensus um, in that accelerated interested parties process, we will report that out at the November meeting. I am comfortable with that. Let me see if there's any comments or questions from the members. How do the members feel about that? Uh, Member Gaines, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I uh, would agree with what's been laid out uh, by uh, Executive Director Fleming. I, that that seems to make sense. So I'll, I'll gather, and then uh, by the time we meet again as a board, uh, we'll have more information, and hopefully we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I see a hand from Member Cohen and then Ms. Stowers. Go ahead, Member Cohen. Yes, thank you uh, very much. I've enjoyed this conversation. I love hearing the experts um, um, share their opinions, and I love it even more when we're in agreement. So I just wanted just to say that um, I concur with the executive director's recommendation on the constitutional amendment. Um, I concur with the Revenue Tax Code 155 um, draft, and I concur with the interested parties process. Thank you. Thank and you. This, uh, oh. one, one more thing, one more thing. I, I assume that this all can come back in November. Yes, that's the, that's, the, that's the goal, okay. yeah. So that we can continue monitoring, yes. discussing. And get feedback as well. Great, thank you. Ms. Stowers, and then I see uh, Member Dronenberg, uh, our chair also from CAA, but let me go with Ms. Stowers. Go ahead. Thank you. As far as the IP process, um, will you be following the normal procedure of reaching out to other tax representatives and agents and advocates? Um, I respect the opinion of CADA, but I would want to make sure that we're hearing from everyone and not just one organization's point of view. Uh, as you. far as the other recommendations, your, your suggestions, I'm okay with those two. Um, and just in general, I will, I did not have the opportunity to speak up earlier, so I want to say um, I understand the need to um, extend taxpayer deadlines in the case of emergencies. I, I truly understand that. Um, the Franchise Tax Board has that authority written in law. And it's, uh, there's so many emergencies happening in California. It's, it's automatic for them. It's, it's not a huge leap. We know it's gonna happen. We know if there's a federal declared emergency um, or a state emergency, the IRS extend their tax filing deadlines. The Franchise Tax Board will follow suit 
mainly, you know, we want to make sure the deadlines are the same. Um, in M March 2020, when we had our stay at home order, the Office of Tax Appeal had the authority to ex extend their deadlines as if as far as following the appeals. Again, they are administering that program and they were able to carry out their program. So I respect the need to have the same authority at the local level. The assessors and the clerks should have the authority to extend tax deadlines in the case of emergency. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And it's uh, was member Flem I'm executive director Fleming. Did you have a quick comment on that or? Uh, no, I don't know. Hold. Uh, my You're comment okay. defer to Assessor Dronenberg. Let me go with uh, Mr. Dronenberg, our president. Go ahead. I think you're muted, though. Thanks for making me a member just a while back there. Uh, well, you, you know, you, you've been a long time member, you know, so it's <laughs> once a member, always a member, right? OK. Brenda, <laughs> uh, in your timeline, um, I was hoping we could get a draft so I could get it to my legislative committee. Is that possible? Uh, yes, what we have just, and I can circle back with you on the details, but just for, for public um, public comment, um, the material that we have today, Ernie, on Government Code 15620 and, um, and on the constitutional material, that material is, is our starting point. Okay. Uh, secondly, we've already started some conversations with our partners in CAA and the Ledge Committee, and so there's some so there's some work that we started as based upon the prior assignments uh, that the board gave me. So we don't have the the the, the draft yet of the 155 piece, but on the other two, on the constitutional language and on uh, Government Code 15620, we do have some language there now. Um, but we can circle back and either today and then by this week have something. So we are prepared to engage with you next week at the Ledge Committee. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, I gave Jeff the green light to start working on that, uh, those other two pieces. So he's already started, uh, but I just wanted to give him the whole basket so that we can make some really studied uh, evaluations by November. Okay, thank you for your support, uh, Assessor Dronenberg, and we've engaged um, and we will make sure that all the material that you all need also is provided. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. I, I see a hand up from a Richard. I don't just see your first name. Is that somebody, one of our partners? I think that's Mr. Ayub from CADA. Oh, okay. Is that an old hand or a new hand? It's an old hand, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Oh, I'll take it down. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and it looks like Mr. Dronenberg. Uh, Mr. Dronenberg, I'm not sure if you had an additional comment or. It's yeah, that looks like another hand from. I don't know if that's an old one or a new one. That's an old one. It's uh, in its 70s. Oh, okay. <laughs> So members, if I just make a final comment with the, with the recommendations I offered earlier, just a, a final comment. Um, as you know, um, what we committed to in, in my capacity and in partnership with you in the 2020 timeframe, um, especially in the early months of COVID, we had regular conversations about lessons learned and takeaways from COVID. Um, and we were going to take a look at those lessons learned um, and any other nuggets, if you will, that would allow us to look at these improvements. We were constrained in the 2020 timeframe, especially in the early months, as you know, as you led us in working with the governor's office and the legislature to get some deadlines. Um, what I see is that at a fundamental level, it is going to be important for us to have more flexible authority in those areas that we currently have, and these are in within the provisions that we have, we do need more flexibility consistent with what the other state agencies have just to be able to respond in the in disasters or public calamity situations. So I think we're all in agreement from that perspective. There may be some disagreements in this in a specific set of nuances um, on 155, but I just wanted to state that for public comment so that we don't lose fact, track of the fact that what we're really trying to do is be consistent with our governmental functions and partners in other agencies um, and really just be able to effectively and efficiently perform and respond to emergency situations. That's consistent with governmental practice. And so to the extent that we have that authority to do so, let's make sure that at a minimum, um, we don't, we don't uh, lose that opportunity to at least get that flexibility. 
while we work on these others. And so we'll come back to you at the November timeframe. Once you decide if you approve my recommendations, we'll come back. Um, if it's a perfect draft, great. Uh, but to Ms. Cohen's uh, comments, it may not be perfect, but we can still work through it. Remembering that the deadline for bill introduction is February, right? So if we don't have a 100% nailed down in November, um, we can come back more discussion at December and January, but we still want to move with some urgency because disasters in California are happening on a regular basis. So uh, we do want to be timely. I will defer to Mr. Young if he has any other comments uh, or corrections to uh, this path forward. Mr. Young, you're muted, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> no corrections, that's funny. Thank you. Mr. Young has veto power. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Members, Thank back to you. you. Uh, let me let me check with Ms. Taylor and see if there's anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item. All right, let's take a look. We do not have any written comments. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press one then zero on your touchtone phone. You may be remove you may remove yourself from queue at any time pressing one zero again. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press one then zero at this time. And we have no one queuing up at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Then what I would like to do on a procedural matter is uh, I guess make the motion that includes everything that we just had a consensus that was presented by our executive director and uh, at least get an official vote so then we can bring this back in the next, well, hopefully next month. Chairman Vasquez? Yes, go ahead. Ms. Tavis. I move that, um, the executive director and her team provided re revision language version two for the constitutional amendment, um, provide revision language for the government code section version two, and have an accelerated IP meeting to discuss changes to RTC 155. And that IP meeting will include all stakeholders and we'll reach out to others that we have not had an opportunity to speak with and hopefully they can come to a consent a, an agreement on the language and they provide that language to us at the November meeting. And if not, at least report out at the November meeting the steps that they have taken so far. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, I would second that. Okay, it's been moved and second. Seeing no other comments or questions. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you could please call the roll. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Deputy Controller Stowers. Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our next item. Our next item is K1E, Organization of Board Workgroups, Follow-up Discussion and Action on the Board Workgroup Charter to formalize the workgroup's forums. This matter will be presented by Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Ms. Sayer. Um, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members, this item K1E um, for the agenda is the organization of the board workgroups. Uh, members at the August 25th meeting, the board approved my recommendation for members to work together to develop a charter or rules of engagement um, for uh, how to how to lead, function, and organize, prepare, plan, etc. The work group meetings uh, today is uh, presented to you as a follow-up discussion regarding your next steps for the organization of the work groups, specifically how you will convene, prepare agendize and hold your work group forums or hearings. Um, this would include uh, your minutes, public meeting materials, working with board proceedings, etc. Uh, I believe Ms. Cohen has provided some additional material that has been attached to our public agenda um, and, and that material has been presented for your consideration. 
Uh, one of the thoughts is members, you could work through this material um, and then I'll and, and pause in just a moment and defer to uh, board member Cohen on this matter. But one of the thoughts is you can take a look at the material, read through it, and then come back for further discussion at the November meeting or at the board's pleasure, you can use a similar process that was used when you develop your governance policy. Uh, but I think it's going to be important for you all to work together in a collaborative manner, and I believe that's Ms. Cohen's desire, work together just to kind of flesh out how do you see them operating so that you're all comfortable with them uh, with the intent of having an additional forum for you to engage with taxpayers. Uh, again, similar to our former board uh, heads, uh, the committee structure, uh, the difference being that um, it's it, it's not as many of the agency staff participating in it, but it does give you that opportunity to do uh, some advanced work um, in, in so many different areas of, of taxation. So I will, um, Madam Cohen, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. And colleagues, I have some prepared remarks that I wanted to read to you um, and also to the members of the public. So they're a little bit lengthy, so I'm apologizing in advance, but I think you'll be interested in, in the thoughts that I want to convey here. And of course, I always like to begin all of my comments with the, just a note of gratefulness um, and to acknowledge and thank uh, Ms. Fleming for her partnership in this work. I'm pleased um, that we're at this point. <laughs> it's uh, it's been an, the it's been an evolution of this process to have um, been able to propose the Board of Equalization Work Group Charter before the board for consideration. Um, we're in this stage in the process because of our collective work, uh, but because of your guidance and partnership. So thank you. With that said, I want to go back and just remind folks, initially uh, I proposed developing a board committee structure in March of 2019. At the time, uh, the concerns were expressed about establishing committees due, due to the passage of AB 102. Um, and after one and a half years of convening uh, board statewide informational hearings and work groups, I proposed in December of 2020 that we take the next step and that we formalize the work group structure utilizing our lessons learned over the past two years. At that time, we unanimously agreed to direct the executive director to provide the board recommended path forward in establishing the structure. And in August of this year, our executive director did that and proposed that the board establish a board work group charter to set the guidelines for establishing and convening uh, work groups. So I agreed to own drafting the charter and before you today is a draft charter for your considerations. Now I'm going to go through exactly what you're reading. Um, so the key components of the, of, of the charter are as follows. It's a purpose, an introduction, a background, the establishment of the work group, more importantly, the scope of the work group, chair, co-chair, and members of the work group, participant of work group, notice requirement of work group meetings, and meetings of the work group. Uh, reporting out of the work group findings, conclusion of the uh, board work group meetings and hearings, and then finally, uh, if applicable, um, uh, policies, procedures, rules, regulations, and laws. So I'd like to highlight a few um, important aspects of the charter. Um, the charter authorizes this board to establish work groups through the chair's discretion or recommendation by a member of the board through an L item. Uh, in both instances, a motion and adoption by the board is required. In establishing the work group, the charter requires the chair of the board or a member of the board to specify the following items. Uh, subject matter and objective, uh, chair and vice chair, or in this case, co-chairs, uh, time frame of the meetings, membership criteria, and the charter requires a public notice of each work group's meeting. The charter also allows for board members to designate a designee to attend work group meetings on their behalf. The charter re requires the chair and or the co-chair to report out on the work group meeting at the next scheduled board meeting. Um, such report, 
such a report out requires um, a written report. Um, and then finally, the charter requires that work groups abide by and comply with all board proceeding procedures, the board's governance policy and all relevant law. So chair, at this time, I'd like to welcome comments and questions from board members. And then uh, what I'd like to do is to present a motion for us to consider. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Seeing no comments or questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Stowers, go ahead. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you for um, taking the time to um, draft a charter. Um, I just got it on Monday, late Monday around 4 p.m. So I haven't had the opportunity to read it thoroughly and um, update the controller. So I am not in a position to um, act on it at this time. I will give you my comments uh, if nobody else is up ready. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Member Cohen for her work on this. Uh, the chart lays out a clear uh, board work group structure, and as we move forward, we can develop further procedural details as needed. I'm prepared to vote on it today if that's the wishes of the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Yvette Stowers. Colleagues, are there any other um, comments? Looks like Member Gaines. Yeah, if I if I could, um, would it be possible to get a little more time? Um, I have I have not reviewed it. I I'm, I apologize, but I've been just busy with these meetings, and if I could get a little more time, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Uh, it sounds so, uh, sounds like so, a good concept. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Let yeah, me just say. Chair, I agree with uh, the member Gaines. <clears throat> Of course you do. Um, it can come back for approval in November. It's not a problem. Miss Yvette, Stowers, stifle, stifle it, Yvette. I, I, hey, I'm just saying, you know, I, I know. appreciate the additional time. Thank you very much. And actually, it's important because it. Hi, I want to make sure it was Betty Yee, the controller that that really pulled together the governance policy. And it and 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 so her weighing in on it is actually important. So proponent pro, uh, postponing it is not a problem. More time, as a matter of fact, quite honestly, I built that into the timeline. Um, so I'm going to read the motion, and the motion actually does um, allow it allow us to come back uh, for more time to, in 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 November. So I'm going to read the motion so you can hear it. Um, then it will frame. I'm thinking your your thoughts around. Um, around um, about what you're going to review. OK, so here we go. This is the, this is the motion uh, that I'm reading into the record. Uh, I have no expectation that we will take action on it, but I want you to hear it out. OK, because I'll bring it back in November. So my motion is acknowledging the need for the board to have a structure for board members to engage in significant policy discussions and address emerging issues without requiring the full use of agency resources needed for regularly scheduled board meetings. Um, Ms. Stowers, I particularly put that in there with you in mind. I, and I am requesting that the board consider the proposed charter and provide recommendations for considerations and possible adoption at the November board meeting. So this approval process that I'm proposing is like, um, is like the approach we use in the development of the board's government policy. So it's just sticking and being consistent with it. So. I'm not asking you to necessarily approve the charter, but I do want you to re review. I want you to be comfortable with it because I really think that this will set the framework for for future board meetings. Um, quite honestly, when all of our time is come and gone on this body, but will still allow us to continue to to move uh, with um, uh, addressing taxpayer needs and, and uh, allowing work to be done. So there it is. That is the motion that um, I guess I'll just bring back in November. Unless you change your mind, you want to vote on it now because you see how benign the motion is. <laughs> Ms. Stowers, I'm, comfortable, I'm comfortable either way, but you know, if people want to wait, we can wait until November. Yeah, it sounds I like it's not going to throw things off track. 
it, it sounds like we don't have consensus. It sounds like Member Gaines wants to wait, Ms. Dowers wants to wait, and um, Mr. Schaefer wants to wait. So I'm I'm fine with that, Ms. Fleming. If you're okay, we'll just wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as the board pleases. So uh, just to restate uh, in support of what I think you, you would like to achieve is at this point, uh, and I'm going to use the word motion in this case, the motion is that the board members take a look at the material. Yes. That's been attached to the pan, which is the draft charter for your consideration. Using a process similar to our governance policy, the members, if you would please take a look at that material and be prepared to have this re-agendized at the November meeting for discussion and possible action. Right. Okay. And, and to summarize that, the motion is you review and we come back on Monday um, and November. That's the motion. That's the motion. So I, I was hoping to state that motion for you, and I'm doing this for for in support of you, my bosses, but also That's for my staff. That's why we're a good team. To capture this motion, uh, that the motion would be to restate that the board consider this information. I'm just giving you a language. I'm not a member, so I'm just a, um, so the board <laughs> language that uh, you would review the material as the the draft charter attached to today's pen. Please review the information and for, be prepared for discussion and possible adoption at the November meeting. At that time, members, the item would be taken up under the L agenda item, the L category. My oh, job is to keep moving, we got to keep moving, we got to keep moving. So, so if that's, if that's, if, you're, if the board accepts that language as proposed language for the motion, I would ask for you to, uh, on behalf of Ms. Cohen, to, ma'am, if I may, uh, that the board adopt uh, that, that motion and make move, move for that motion. Okay, so I understand what you're saying, Member Cohen. Basically, you're giving us homework. And I'm okay with homework. <laughs> I'm trying to find a polite way of saying it on her behalf. <laughs> Which, but, but, but it's in line with what, what you said and what Mr. Gaines I, said. Yeah. You said you yeah, wanted no, more time to review. Sure. Yeah. sure. So, okay. so who's making so the motion? I saw what Ms. Fleming said. Okay. I was just offering up suggested language for the motion, sir, for the okay, sake I of think staff. I, I move that the board um, review, review the draft charter and be prepared to discuss the charter, make changes, and make changes if necessary at the November meeting and then adopt if we have agreement. I will second that motion. Thank um, you. Chairman no, Dowser Henry, no, Henry, no, Henry. I hate it when you pop up on the screen, Henry. Henry. <laughs> what, what, what do we have from our legal team here? Uh, just, just a friendly suggestion. If you want to add to the motion, you can send the comments to board proceeding staff to um, for lack of a better term, co uh, coordinate the proposed changes and they can work with member Cohen's office. That may get you further along on the past path, but it's up to you, the members. Um, okay, so it was just a friendly suggestion. Uh, thank you for the friendly suggestion. This is just to nail down the motion right now that they will review the material and come back at the November meeting. Um, so we're not making any other, if, if, the, if the motion was just moved and second and adopt, and once you vote on it, if that's the motion, let's hold the scope to the motion at this point, if you will, please. Not a problem, just making a suggestion. Thank you, Chief Counsel. So we have a motion, it's been moved and second. Any comments or questions? Seeing and hearing none. Ms. Taylor, do we have to ask for public comment before we vote on this? Yeah. Yes, we do. Let's do that first then. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there's anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? And once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press one then zero at this time. And we have no one queuing up at this time. Thank you. With that, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the roll on the motion. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Deputy Controller Stowers. Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. With that, uh, we will move forward. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you please call the next item. The next item 
is K3A, Property Tax Deputy Director's Report, Operational Updates, a report on the status of pending and upcoming projects, activities, and departmental issues. This matter will be presented by Mr. Young. Yes, <clears throat> good morning, Chair Vasquez, honorable members of the board. Uh, my name is David Young, Deputy Director of the Property Tax Department, and I will provide a brief report on our operational updates for, for the department, and then I will turn it over to the chief of each of our respective of the respective uh, divisions there, Ms. Uh, Patty Lumsden and Mr. Jack McCool to give you a little bit more uh, detail. So as a whole, the property tax department is actually doing quite well this month. Um, we have begun our internal processes of reviewing all our 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 uh, our, our internal um, uh, work processes. So that is a long term project. We have started on it and we've actually taken a look at a couple of them already. So things are looking good there. For CAPD, there much work is attached to uh, implementation of Prop 19. So there is still a lot of uh, inquiries coming in and we are also preparing uh, some guidance on that. Uh, for SAPD, much work continues on our assessment appeals. So the season, we're about halfway through our season. Um, we still have appeals coming before you in November and in December. And work is also be, uh, also continuing on the audits of some of our state assessees. So with that, it, I would like to turn it over for to first to Ms. Lumsden for a, a little bit more detail on on the county assessed properties division side. So Ms. Lumsden, if you're available. I am. Thank you, Mr. Young. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable board members. This is Patty Lumsden. I'm chief of the county assessed properties division. Today I'm going to be giving you three brief reports on the following three BOE programs, letters to assessors, appraisal training and certification, and assessment practices surveys. These brief reports are for your information only and do not require a specific action to be taken. First, I will start with a brief report on letters to assessors. Attached to the agenda this month is a memo on letters to assessors. This memo provides a list of the LTAs that have been issued since our last board meeting and provides a link to the BOE's website where a list of all LTAs issued to date can be found. So far to date for calendar year 2021, BOE staff have issued a total of 46 LTAs and six of those LTAs have been issued since our last board meeting. Those, L those six LTAs consist of one which provides the annual per acre value of California irrigated cropland for lean date 2022 to be used by assessors when valuing and forcibly restricted land subject to an urban agricultural incentive zone contract as provided under revenue and taxation code section 422.7. The next LTA provides the annual interest component of the capitalization rate for lien date 2022 to be used by assessors when valuing qualified historical property that is under contract to restrict the property's use in order to promote its continued preservation as provided under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 439.2. Next, an LTA which provides the annual interest component of the capitalization rate for lien date 2022 to be used by assessors when valuing and forcibly restricted open space lands as provided under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 423. We also have issued an LTA announcing uh, the uh, State Board of Equalization and the 58 counters, County Assessors meeting, um, which we had yesterday, and then also two more LTAs which uh, issued assessment practices surveys for both Calaveras County and for Nevada County. And that concludes my report on letters to assessors, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have before moving on to the next report. Seeing no questions, I will go ahead and start my next report, report which is on BOE's appraisal training and certification. Since our last meeting, we have taught three more virtual classes of our most popular classes requested. To date, during calendar year 2021, we have taught a total of 13 virtual classes and trained a total of 424 students. BOE staff continues to make improvements to our virtual training courses by 
staying on top of the latest technology and tools available to us through Microsoft Office Teams, reviewing and adjusting the course material as needed, and collecting and listening to feedback from students as well as from county assessors and their staff in order to make this training experience productive and beneficial for both the instructors and the students who attend our classes. In addition, BOE staff partnered with staff from the San Luis Obispo County Assessor's Office to present a virtual CASA webinar on Proposition 19, Face Your Value Transfers. CASA, which is the California Assessor's Administrative Services Association, is an affiliate with the California Assessor's Association. More than 1,000 people were in attendance, which consisted of BOE staff and assessors and their staff. This concludes my report on training and certification, and I'm available to answer questions you may have. And I see um, Mr. Gaines. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, yesterday we had our breakout session, and um, David Stottlemyre was talking a little bit about difficulty of getting to uh, live seminars you know, in-person seminars. He was actually very complimentary of the the outreach that we're doing with the online, but he said that, um, you know, there are instances where it's nice to be in a room and meet with folks and you can ask follow-up questions more easily and things of that nature. And I'm just wondering, can we try to address that issue so that, um, you know, he's down in Inyo, right? So that's, that's not, that's a, a lightly populated area and I don't know kind of where the natural location would be to have a class but um, something that might be a little closer to him that could be in person would be helpful I just want to pass that on to you because it came up in our um, our breakout session yesterday uh, certainly Mr. Gaines I appreciate those comments and um, we are definitely aware of uh, the need for in-person training uh, we're not planning on doing away with our in-person training. We have simply, due to COVID and not being able to go out and teach classes at this time, we have thrown, we have put together this virtual training uh, program so that we can continue to teach uh, the assessors and their staff during this time. So the virtual training was really just put into place as a way to continue on our education requirements for staff and um, and so it's it's still a work in progress of course and we know that there's you know improvements that need to be made and we're working all the time to do that but we do understand the need for that in-person communication because it does some people learn differently is one reason the other reason is some classes are more difficult and require more mathematical calculations which don't always uh, seem to uh, connect as well through a virtual training experience is the words I was looking for. Um, okay. So yeah, we are very much aware of that. We're hoping in the future, once we can go back to more um, doing in-person training at this time, um, under our state guidelines, we are not able to send our staff out to do in-person training, as well as perhaps some of the counties maybe aren't able to, to accept us to come and do their training either. Uh, so we are working on that for uh, going forward. We will probably be doing something like a hybrid where we will have some in-person training and we will do some virtual training because we do find it beneficial to do the virtual training, but we're finding that it maybe is oriented towards maybe some of the classes such as to our course 2A and course 3 um, that are not do not require as many cal mathematical calculations and therefore are not as difficult for a virtual training experience, but we're still working through those kinks. Um, we have been working with the assessors and uh, some of their staff in getting some of that feedback back on those classes and how we can um, better serve the students that are taking them. And um, so we're definitely getting that feedback and we're responding to it as well. So um, it's been a very good conversation back and forth between us. And I've also attended the Real Property Chiefs Conference and discussed that very issue of our training and how well the virtual training is going. And so we definitely are in works and communication with them on that. That's good. Now, I don't want to dissuade um, our move forward on virtual classes because um, I, I think um, even, even the more complicated ones, maybe that's the only option 
for some of our county assessor uh, staffing. And um, but I'm I would like you if you could. Uh, could you call Assessor David Stottlemyre and just maybe give him an update in terms of expectation of when the next class would be, the next in-person class, just so we're 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 kind of touching base and communicating. Oh, certainly, I can definitely reach out to Mr. Stottlemyre. That'd be great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, you're muted. There we are. Uh, I uh, agree with uh, uh, Member Gaines and uh, the importance of uh, not losing sight of uh, real, real speakers. Uh, I think uh, the virtual program is all we have for some people. But as I've gone through uh, college and law school, I've had some favorite professors, uh, and that's only because of their demeanor. When they say something funny, we laugh. Uh, uh, I think these are very important and. Uh, they, they sometimes become entertaining as well as educational, and that's uh, much harder to do virtually. So I'd like to uh, speak out for uh, a real program now and then becoming available to most anybody. And if we have to send a few people to a motel, uh, uh, you know, by car someplace, uh, I think it's a good investment uh, to bring these people to uh, an occasional real class as well as the very fine work you're doing on virtual. Thank you. I appreciate those comments and I, I completely agree with you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cohen. Um, thank you. I actually wanted to a little echo a little bit of what I what I heard Senator Gaines saying about um, assessors. In the breakout meeting yesterday that I had with my assessors, I had a handful of them, I had about 12 of them. Um, one of the things that I definitely heard uh, from my smaller, more rural counties is that their appreciation for the online training and that it, how it's a huge success and it is a huge um, lift uh, that they don't have to spend, and I'm particularly talking about like Humboldt County, right? Hours away from San Francisco, from the Bay Area, several hours even from Sacramento, that they don't have to spend time getting in the car, driving, hotel, lodging, uh, paying for m meals, and that they were able to, to get on. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she said there was almost a thousand people on, on the training that was conducted. So um, consistently what I heard was uh, kudos to the BOE staff. And um, Patricia, in particular, I think this has to do with your department and the work that you're doing in terms of providing them services. So keep up the good work. I just wanted to pass the compliment on to you. Thank you for those for those comments and the compliment. I really appreciate it. And it's definitely my staff that has done the hard work in getting these classes out and um, and and adapting to this virtual training. It definitely has been a, a, a big lift for them and they've done a really great job. So I appreciate those comments. Great. If there are no further comments, I'll move on to my last report, which is on the assessment practices surveys. So far to date for calendar year 2021, we have completed and issued assessment practices survey reports for seven counties. Those counties are San Diego County and District 4, Alpine County and District 1, Yuba County and District 1, Orange County and District 4, Lassen County and District 1, Calaveras County and District 1, Nevada County and District 1. These survey reports were issued via letters to assessors and are posted on the BOE's website. In addition, we are actively working on completing surveys and or samples for 11 other counties, six in District 1, four in District 2, and one in District 3. These surveys and samples are in various stages of completion. Once the survey and samples are completed and the reports are ready to be issued prior to issuance via letters to assessors and posting to the BOE's website, a copy of the report is provided to each of the board members and their office for preview. Staff continues to work surveys, uh, conduct surveys and samples remotely by developing and continuously improving their procedures and processes to safely and securely obtain electronic data and conduct interviews with county assessors and their staff. In addition, we have begun reviewing our assessment practices survey program for overall process improvement by looking for inefficiencies and ways to improve the program. This concludes my report on assessment practices surveys, and I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Member Gaines. Yeah, thank you um, 
for the update on on the surveys and you know i'm just curious um you know as a board as members of the, the boe are, are we proactive enough when it comes to these surveys and having a handle in terms of what's going on in the county assessor's offices i i know that um and i you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the needs of our county assessors because I think they've got some real labor issues, especially in some of these more rural counties, but they also have backlog issues. And um, and that seems to me to really exacerbate issues with our constituents if they can't get, you know, if they're getting a supplement several years later on uh, a property that they purchased, um, that can really compound into a big problem and could even be a multi-year supplement. And so I, I'm just trying to get a handle on what is our role as, bold, as the board when it comes to these surveys. Uh, you know, we have the constitutional authority to do them, uh, but is there anything more that we should be doing or is it just we do the survey, it becomes public information and that's it? So our um, assessment practices survey reports and our surveys, they are uh, compliance audits uh, for a particular county during a particular time frame. So that's that's one thing I'd like to yes. Uh, yes. make clear. Um, yes. And so the comments that you brought up about you know uh, assessor's backlog, I know right now, I mean that is something that we do report on it when we find it. But right now, uh, several of the counties. Um, multiple counties, I should say, have a backlog due to some of the COVID issues that we've had in the past year. So that's a little bit different than what our compliance audit would be reviewing. Those are some of, you know, their internal things that they have had little to no control over, just like everyone else, I believe, during this COVID right. pandemic. So I think those are some issues um, that, you know, definitely are something to think about whether or not they would be vetted through our assessment practices survey re, you know report and process um, but that's not to say that's not a good point for you to have made and um, to we can maybe discuss that or come back to you at another time with that information i know that you know in our in our review of the agenda earlier in the week um, you know we had discussed this and i i think you had indicated i don't want to put words in your mouth but my recollection was that that this is public, you know, the information is public and that there are people watch it. And uh, so it seemed to be an awareness um, in general of, of these surveys. And if you want to get information, it's publicly available. Um, so that made me feel a little better, but I am just curious as to, you know, is this always the way we've done it? And uh, if so, is is that the right way to do it as we move forward? Yes, yeah, so certainly our survey reports are definitely public. They're um, uh, issued through letters to assessors, which of course are on our um, uh, our website. So it's available to anyone in the public to review. Um, again, I think the particular thing that you're you're referring to in, is the current backlog that the county assessors are facing regarding, like I said, some of the shutdown of the state during COVID. And so we're finding more and more of them that are having the same problem. Um, but as far as the well, let information- me, Let me sorry. clarify, let sure. me clarify that, because I'm, I'm really not concerned as much about that, because I think uh, that is understandable. And uh, you know, <clears throat> agencies and businesses across the board are struggling as a result of COVID. But, I'm talking about more of a um, systematic issue uh, that's gone on for years and years that is not being addressed. And I don't know to what degree the BOE might be able to help out, but I, these often seem to be recruitment issues uh, uh, for job positions that maybe for whatever reason, they can't get the proper funding for salaries. Because it seems to me if you could put a good salary and um, benefit package together, you could draw more applicants. But, um, you know, it does it does weigh on taxpayers uh, and they're not getting uh, they're not getting treated in the way that I think 
you know, in a perfect world, we'd want them treated in terms of getting these supplements and they can add up to big numbers. And um, as time passes, you, as a property owner, you might forget about it and suddenly you've got thousands of dollars to do. And so I just bring it up because I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with how do you deal with it? And is there anything that we can do it about it as the BOE? So certainly outside of COVID, if we if there is a particular county when we're doing that survey and they are do have a backlog that is that could potentially affect taxpayers as well as escaped assessments on the roll, we do put that into our report and it is identified in our report. So just to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for that, Patty. I think Mr. Young uh, wanted to comment. Thank you. I, 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 I wanted to just support Ms. Lumsden. She is correct. The, our, our survey is, is in essence a compliance audit. We do, it, it is public. We do publish it and we do send it to quite a few stakeholders, not the least of which is the local board of supervisors. So it, it is widely, it is widely distributed and it is looked at by many folks. I understand there is concern whether it's a backlog or 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 some type of other issue. Our ability to help with any of the recruitment process, it's if it is indeed a a a salary issue, it's it's really hard for us to have much influence on that. It, that we we have we have very little control over. Or, or oversight of, of individual assessors' offices uh, um, budget or their salary structure. Sure. So we do yeah, bring we do bring light to it, though. Yeah. More I think about it, it's like, well, they've got to, you know, the, the assessor has to convince the board of supervisors that they need more funding. I think in many of these cases, uh, because if you can't if you can't offer the the right package, um, I don't know how you're going to fill those positions. Um, and I don't know to what degree we could help them um, as uh, in recruitment or I don't know. I don't. Yeah. It seems more like a, more that I think about it. It's more like a local issue, and it sounds like we're satisfying our constitutional duties or our uh, statute-based uh, duties. If I may, I really appreciate the comments, and I think we're all thinking. You know, uh, Member Gaines in the in the same uh, same vein. Uh, to 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 Dave and Patty's comments. Um, in my experience working with the assessors and the surveys, they do in fact do exactly what you're saying. They take it as data. Now, of course, there's 50 county assessors, and so there may be some variance there, but they do take that information and have discussions with their local government um, leadership. Um, and we've been, you know, with some of the assessors who are looking for that data specifically to write their justification for additional funding or positions. But it becomes a local government issue, and that's you know even though we have oversight of the assessment practices, to Dave and Patty's point from a compliance, but we're uh, statutorily our jobs. Um, but we're, we've had many times where they've reached out to us to ask for additional information or some assistance, and we have you know in my experience have been um, making ourselves available to assist where we can. But it really is them writing their documentation. What what we find at the local government level is that they are not the only, the assessor is not the only um, group coming to the table to the Board of Supervisors asking for funding, right? So they sometimes are fighting with, you know, the assessor get more funding to do the appraisals, or does it go to fire, or does it go to schools? So that is when you're getting to that that level of, of governmental yes. administration, it's a little beyond the scope of what, uh, yeah. what the uh, assessment practice survey sure. is designed to yeah, do. Yeah, the, the more I think about it, it's like, well, people are upset about it, they'll let their county supervisor know. Right. Oh, yeah. And then, and, and exactly, exactly. So to Dave and Patty's point, we've scoped it out. Now, I does not mean to say that there's not always a room for improvement in our processes. And one of the things that you've heard from the uh, manager's report is that our next phase is to look at processes and process improvements in terms of how we procedurally handle them. So if there's yeah. anything that, as we examine our own work, that you know there's room for improvement, efficiencies, etc., right. we absolutely will look at that. Um, yeah. But changing the, the intent of that of that uh, that function, um, we're, we're great. complying. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Good discussion. Thank you, sir. I see that Mr. Jornenberg has a, his hand up. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, Mr. Gaines, uh, this issue has been talked and talked and talked for probably 40 years, and the legislature has um, cut back and sequenced these issues. And yet, when you talk with the other assessors, and I've had the advantage of doing that, the small counties, they they really want this. This is the only people that really come in and take a look at their business and can give them really good help. And that helps them improve, that brings them good ideas from the auditors that come in, also make suggestions they picked up from other best practices from other small assessors. Uh, the big guys, like myself, I'm audited probably four or five times a year by every department there is because I'm a big department. I get a lot of audits. So this is just one of many for me. But okay. the small counties and your district, if you go to your county assessors, they're going to say, you know, Mr. Gaines, or, we really appreciate this work. Yes. It helps us. Yeah, so. they, they've told me that in the past. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, if I see no other further comments, I will return this back to um, Mr. Young. Thank, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Lumsden, for a very thorough report. And thank you to you and your staff for all your hard work. So with that, Mr. McCool, if you are available, can you report on the State Assessed Properties Division's uh, operational updates? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members. My name is Jack McCool, Chief of the State Assessed Properties Division. Today, I will provide information on the status of ongoing work in our division. Last week, SAPD staff mailed private railroad car tax bills to 212 private railroad car assessees. These bills reflect the private railroad car rule that the board adopted in July. The tax is due on December 10th and the revenue collected from the tax goes to the state's general fund. Staff are continuing to work on property tax audits as well. Some audits are nearing completion or are scheduled to be submitted to, state, to senior staff for review soon. However, due to our petition workload, the availability of senior staff to review audits will be limited until we are closer to the completion of the appeal season. Other audits remain in progress and staff are working closely with assessees to coordinate the sharing of information in the telework environment for all sides. Finally, staff continue to work diligently on state assessed appeals. Yesterday, the board took action on 12 petitions, including seven penalty abatement requests. Staff continue to work with assessee representatives in an attempt to resolve remaining issues. We had appeals conferences scheduled with several assessees this month and more are scheduled for next month. We will have more petitions for the board's consideration at the November board meeting. That concludes my summary report of ongoing work in the state assessed properties division. Thank you. OK. This concludes the portion of uh, our operational updates today. I turn it back to you, Ms. Uh, oops. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions of uh, Mr. McCool's presentation? Comments or questions? Uh, seeing and hearing none. Ms. Taylor, do we have uh, any public comment on this item? We do not have any uh, written public comments on this item. Can we check with AT&T? Yes. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there's anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? And once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press one then zero at this time. And we have no one queuing up at this time. Thank you. Uh, with that, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our next item. Our next item is K3B, Property Tax Deputy Director's Report, Operational Updates, Welfare Exemption Process Improvement Project. Report on the status of the Welfare Exemption Process Improvement Project. 
This matter will be presented by Mr. Young and Ms. Keach. Yes, good morning again, Chair Vasquez and honorable members of the board. On this, on this report, I will have Ms. Lauren Keach, the manager of, of the welfare exemption uh, section, uh, report to you. So, Ms. Keach, if you're available. Yes, thank you, Mr. Young. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members of the board. My name is Lauren Keach, and as Mr. Young said, I'm the manager of the welfare exemption section of the property tax department. Um, today, I'm going to give you an update on the welfare exemption process improvement plan. Um, the welfare exemption is unique in that it is co-administered by the county assessors and the BOE. The BOE determines whether the organization itself is organized and operated for a qualifying purpose, while the county assessor determines whether an organization's property qualifies for the exemption based on the property's use. The BOE issues either an organizational clearance certificate or a supplemental clearance certificate to organizations that meet the qualifications as specified in Revenue and Taxation Code Section 214. As a way to improve our process, the BOE's welfare exemption section is working on a plan to streamline the process for granting a supplemental clearance certificate to qualifying entities seeking to exempt low income housing from property taxation. Since the last board meeting, staff continues detailed work of reviewing each step and requirement in the welfare exemption process of granting a supplemental clearance certificate. Our first step is an examination of the application process itself. In further detail, staff has analyzed and revised the checklist and claim form, which has been submitted for internal review. In these revisions, the checklist and claim form have been updated to enhance their user friendliness um, of the form and make it less cumbersome for claimants to navigate. Our goal is to provide a more clear and concise application process for the claimants. Once this step is complete, we will continue to our review of the internal claims and approval process and investigate areas for improvement and opportunities to increase efficiency. We have attached a project plan to today's public agenda notice with our goal that illustrates our steps and the phases of the project with an anticipated timeline. We are currently in phase one of the application process, which is the review phase. And I'm glad to report that staff remain dedicated to this project to revitalize and modernize our program to better serve our taxpayers. We will continue to provide updates and information regarding workflow improvements to allow for visibility into the process and ensure the board is informed. Members, this concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Real quick, uh, Ms. Keats, is it Ms. Keats? Is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, that's correct. Is this your first time presenting to us? I presented last week, but it was on the phone. So this is my first time on camera in person or virtually in person. <laughs> Welcome. Yes. Uh, and I will initiate you with my first question. OK. <laughs> uh, you mentioned on the, the O. I know you you've done a real good job staff as a whole just on uh, simplifying the forms. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering, um, how are we doing or or do we feel pretty good about the process in terms of the measures in terms of educating folks on the, these new forms and documents as we need that you know as they need to submit these are they pretty i guess user friendly well that's what we are trying to improve and as i mentioned we do have a checklist that coincides with the form so we took a look at our checklist to make sure it's clearly presenting the information that we are requesting as well as looking at what is the information we are requesting and is it necessary and how can we just improve that to streamline it for applicants so make that more simple on their end. Thank you and welcome, welcome. Thank you. Let me see if there's other, any other comments or questions from any of the other members. I see member Cohen. Yeah, I do, Maybe. thank you. Go ahead. Thanks for acknowledging me. I was just wondering, um, the welfare exemption process improvement project. I mean, what, um, how quickly will, will, we, will we be able to implement some of these, you know, changes, fine tuning this process? Well, um, as I mentioned, we have the project plan that we attach to the public agendas notice for today, which does kind of help lay it out how we plan to go through each step. And uh, each step has a phase. So I think we're looking at maybe a quarter or so for each 
process. So we're hoping, you know, to complete the application process. I think we have March 2022 is would be the completion for that part of our process. And then that also will overlap with beginning our claims process. So we kind of have a timeline laid out and when we um, anticipate getting through each part of the process. And do you have a, a backlog of cases or files that you're working through? I would say we have a moderate backlog. Um, we are working diligently to process these claims as well as um, including more staff as we fill our vacancies to get through more claims. So, um, but we are trying to find ways to speed up the process on our end so we don't either increase or, you know, further maintain a backlog. And how many uh, uh, staff members do you have and how many vacancies do you have? Oh, let's see, we've just filled a few vacancies. So at this time for the exemptions unit and um, Patty Lumpson can correct me if I'm wrong. So we have, I'm just gonna count in my head because we just added uh, two new staff members. I believe we have a team of six now and we have four vacancies remaining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. And where did you do your recruiting for those vacancies? Curious. Um, we do them through CalHR, through our uh, BOE. Okay. So marketing. the state. Yes. Got it. We have used LinkedIn as well um, for some of the more entry level positions just to expand our pool of candidates. Okay. Thank you. I have another question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a hand from Ms. Stowers, and I think that's it right now. Go ahead, Ms. Stowers. Thank you. Um, this is a basic question, but what's the difference between the application process and the claims process? So the application process would be for the claimant, um, either you know going to our website, doing the research, filling out how to how to fill out the form, what documents they need to provide. So to simplify the process on their end, and then the claims process would be when we receive that claims packet. How can we improve that process on our end and speed up the processing. Got you. That that makes sense now because I was thinking that you had an application and you had a claims, but it's not it's still the same documents, but how to make it user friendly for the the claimant and then how to improve your internal process. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Uh, I see one more hand here from member Gaines, unless that's an old hand. No, it's a new one. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Keach. Appreciate the presentation. It's refreshing to hear that we're taking a look at processes, mm -hmm. and, uh, trying to streamline those. So uh, that's very encouraging and uh, just uh, keep up the good work. And uh, I know that um, Lisa Renati is working hard to help fill vacancies too within the BOE. So I'm hoping that you'll get some additional support soon uh, so you can move forward. But that, I, I really am encouraged when I hear about how we can do processes better within the BOE and uh, streamline that and make it user friendly for an applicant that's going through the process. So thank you. Definitely, thank you. And I see one last hand here from our president, Dronenberg. Uh, yes, I just wanted to compliment the board for seeing this as an area that needed work because historically this has been a long time processing these applications and it, it really um, slows taxpayers up. And um, we really put a lot of emphasis on, on my office to, as soon as we get the uh, the the approval to get back to the tax and help them get through the process but sounds like a lot of good work and the board should be uh, uh, take credit for this recognizing a slow and trying to correct that as a good thank you we appreciate that thank you and i just have one last question for you um and i'm not sure it's if it's something that you have the answer for, it might be one another staffer, but let me just ask on the welfare exemption, do we have like a, an inventory? When I was meeting yesterday with my assessor, uh, 
Jeff here in LA County, he mentioned that they have somebody in LA County that has uh, a list of all the public owned properties in the county of Los Angeles. And I'm wondering, do we have like an inventory list of all the public owned land in the state of California? Thinking like, you know, federal, state, city, school district, college districts? Um, I don't have that information. Maybe Patty or Dave can direct you on that, but. Of course, I'd be more than happy to address that. So the, the short answer is we do not. We do not have a comprehensive list of all publicly owned land. Uh, as, as, you, as you've already mentioned, there are many entities that own, that own land. They are either city, county, uh, state, and federal. So they're, they're probably in multiple databases. Interesting. And it sounds like uh, our President Dronenberg might have a, an answer for me. Well, um, as a gross kind of answer, 85% of the state is not owned by the people of the state. It's owned by one entity or government entity, the federal, the state, or the local. 85% of the state is owned by those three entities. Thank you. And uh, sorry for drilling you so hard on your first day, Ms. Lee, but <laughs> you did excellent. And it's okay. I'm hoping, I was ready I'm for hoping it. <laughs> your executive director is taking notes. Yeah, you did a fantastic job. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you for your kind words and your support um, of our new staff. Uh, Ms. Keech is, uh, has been with us for a little while, new into this role, but has been with us actually for a little while. It's doing really good work. It is nice uh, to see the new faces as we engage in our workforce development and our succession plan to make sure that we have continuity of good services uh, over the next, uh, next couple of generations. So Ms. Keech, thank you, and thank you to your staff. Thank you very much. Yes, thank Ms. you. Ms. Taylor, do we have any written comments on this item? We do not have any written comments. Can we check with AT&T real quick? Certainly. AT&T moderator, can you let us know if there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on this matter? And ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to make a comment, please press 1 then 0. Press 1 then 0 this time to make your comment. And it appears that no one has signaled that they wish to speak. Thank you. Uh, with that, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call our next item. The next item is M1, Public Policy Hearings, Proposition 19 Implementation. Items that appear under these matters provide information to the members and may require board action or direction. There are no planned staff reports or external speakers for this agenda item for this meeting. However, persons who wish to address the board on this topic as a public comment may do so. The matter will be presented by Chairman Vasquez. Thank you. Um, members, I, well, oh, actually I see a, a hand from Member Cohen. Yes, go ahead, Member Cohen. Thank you. I was, uh, I was wondering if we could take a break um, before we get into you know the hearing and 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 um and 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 f and so forth the rest of the agenda is that something we could do sure what, what's what's appropriate i'll leave that up what do you how much time do you think we need um well i was thinking generally we take a, a 40 45 minute break if i'm not sure executive director please remind me is it a, uh, is it an hour <laughs> i don't recall <laughs> Uh, I'd like to take as short as we can, but I want to be respectful of the members. What, what, uh, what's are staff? we talking on the chair? Are, are we talking asking? lunch break, not uh, just? Uh, yes. Yes. Miss Evans, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy with 30 minutes. So I'm just was just uh, deferring to give the members an opportunity to comment. So um, it, we could do a 30 minute break uh, that would give an opportunity to for a quick nibble. Staff, I'm sure, would appreciate having a quick break. We would then resume uh, with the AAB discussion uh, following uh, following that item. So uh, you do know that we've got guests on the, on with us, and so hopefully this is uh, being sensitive to their schedules also. But a 30-minute break would be appreciated. 
So it sounds like a 30 minute would be ample time for us and hopefully not inconvenience our speakers. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, why don't we do that? It's uh, I have like 12 10, so I guess 1240 will reconvene. OK, very good. Thank you, members. Thank you all for your patience. Yeah, we'll see you back at 1240. 30 minutes. <laughs>